Welcome back. At this point, what we've managed to do with our um, formulation of the finite element method for these 1D linear elliptic PDEs is um, actually state the problem in completeness, right? We've uh, derived the matrix vector equations for um, linear and quadratic basis functions explicitly. And we've also uh, laid out the path to be followed when we go to higher order basis functions. And while in the formulations we uh, developed, we carried out um, analytic integrations of uh, all the terms that were needed, we've also looked at how we would go about carrying out numerical quadrature, right? numerical integration. And uh, numerical integration is what would actually be done in a code which uh, before too long you will also be writing. What I'd like to do now is, um, well, actually observe that uh, we are ready to move on to other problems, right? We are now ready to move on to multidimensional problems. Before we do that, however, it's uh, important to understand um, a little more, just a little more about the mathematical basis of the finite element method. And uh, there are at least two things we need to do. What we will start doing with this segment, and it'll take three or four segments or maybe a little longer, uh, what we will do is to um, understand why the finite element method works, what its uh, special properties are, and also get a, um, a fairly high level view of the way finite element convergence works. Right? And we'll see the mathematical basis to this. We'll see a few uh, simple proofs for why the method works. Okay? All right. So that's the plan. We are going to start by talking of um, norms. Okay? And, and by this, we mean mathematical norms, right? How do we estimate the, so to, so to speak, the magnitude of certain functions, okay? In a manner that makes sense for what we have to do here. Okay, let me give you a little background before we really plunge into this subject. And let us start by considering the following, right? Consider uh, the, um, the finite dimensional uh, trial solution that we are working with. Okay? So consider the finite dimensional trial solution. Uh, UH. One thing I'm going to start doing from now on is uh, perhaps stop referring to this as the finite dimensional trial solution, though it is that, uh, but actually start calling it the finite element solution. Okay? And so this is the field that we would get by carrying out the finite element solution and maybe going back and reinterpolating from the trial solution degrees of freedom. Okay? Uh, so let me, let me also state that. Also called the finite element solution. Okay? That's probably how we, I will uh, refer to it from as, as we move on. All right. Uh, we'll consider it in the context of the problem we are solving. So we have something like that. And um, let's suppose we have some number of elements here. Okay, what I'm going to do is consider to show that there is some generality, I mean, complete generality with what I want to state. Uh, let's consider that we are using here um, quadratic basis functions. Okay, so that would mean uh, what I'd intended to be elements here, each of them has mid side nodes. Okay, so this now is uh, omega 1. Right, that represents some general element omega e. Right, I'm going to now sketch out the quadratic basis functions. All right, 
So, we have uh, that, we have n2, and I'm sorry, it's sort of strayed over a little. Let me try to do better. We have n2 and we have n3, right, for this element. Okay, I'm not going to, well, let me label them just for this one maybe. n1, n2, and n3. Okay, uh, for element 2, let me perhaps use a different color so we can uh, highlight a certain point. Okay, so for element 2, my uh, shape fun my basis functions are going to be that, okay? Can I can do better than that? Sorry. Okay, that's n1 for element 2. That is n2 for element 2. And that is n3. Okay? So again, I'll say n1, n2, n3, okay? Now, of course, we also know that associated with each of these nodal points, we get a trial solution degree of freedom values, right? So let me write those. And here I'm going to write them using global numbering, okay? So here I have d1, uh, I have d two here, I realize I switched from sub to superscripts in the first one, okay. D1, D2, I'm going to write D3 here, D4, D5, and so on, okay. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, the way you would, we would construct our field UH now, right, uh, within each element uh, E would be obtained by uh, that process, right, um, DAE, and we know how to go between uh, local and global no, uh, degree of freedom numbers. Okay. Observe the nature of our um, basis functions here. I'm going to ask you a question. What I've sketched here in red and green are the basis functions, respectively, for elements 1 and 2. Is the solution UH continuous? So the solution, the finite element solution that one would generate by reinterpolating from the trial solution degrees of freedom, would that be continuous? Right, think about it. The answer is yes, it is continuous. Okay. Uh, mathematical notation for a continuous function is uh, C0 on omega. Okay. When we say a function is C0 on omega, we're saying C0 simply means the function itself is continuous, right, uh, over the domain omega. Okay. Uh, what about its derivatives? Are the function uh, are its derivatives continuous over omega? Think about that. Well, let me ask you in steps now. Uh, uh, comma x. It turns out that it is continuous within each element. Right? So if I look at uh e comma x, right, restricted to a single element, right, within that element e, the derivative is also continuous. Okay? So we would say that this function is c0 on uh, omega e. Right? So the derivative is continuous within each element. Right? What about over the entire domain? Is the derivative continuous across the domain? In general, well, not in general. The, the derivative indeed is not continuous across the domain. In particular, there are points of discontinuity on the, in the derivatives, right? At element edges, 
like there and there, right? What we will see is that u h comma x is discontinuous. Okay? All right? So, so u h comma x is discontinuous Uh, in all of omega, right? So now here, what I'm specifying is that we are not considering U H restricted to a single element, right? It is across elements. Okay, so it's discontinuous in omega, and so what we say, however, is that U H comma X, the the derivative, is uh, not in C zero when we take the entire domain omega into consideration, okay? So this is an important thing to notice, right? And um, where does this come from? Why is it that the solution UH, right, the finite element solution is itself continuous, but its derivatives when considered over the entire domain omega are discontinuous? Where does that, where does that come from? Right, it comes from the basis functions. Right? So, what's important to notice here is that the Lagrange polynomial basis functions have been constructed to be only C0 on omega, right? We have basis functions which are only continuous and that's immediately observable uh, if you just look at this um, sketch that I made of the basis functions, right? Clearly the basis functions are continuous but of course if you look at the uh, inter-element nodes, it's clear that, that the derivatives are not going to be continuous. And of course, once you have that, any function that you then construct using that basis to represent the function is also going to be only continuous, but not be continuous in its derivatives, okay? Um, so we say that it's only C0. We say that it is not... Um, the function itself now, the function uh, or sorry, the basis functions themselves uh, are not um, Cn on omega for n greater than 1, sorry, n greater than 0. Okay? Right, the basis functions themselves have been constructed to only be continuous. They're C0, okay? Their derivatives are not continuous, okay? Right, if their derivatives were continuous, we would say the functions would be Cn, right? Where n would be the number of derivatives that were continuous, okay? So we're saying that the basis functions are not Cn, they're only C0, okay? All right, so let me just give you an additional statement here to give you the more general case. In general, a function is in Cn omega if its derivatives to order n are continuous on omega, all right? Our basis functions themselves are continuous, none of their derivatives are continuous, therefore they are only C0, okay? The zero indicates no derivative continuity, okay? However, 
Remember when we talked about um, spaces, we introduced the spaces L2 and H1, okay? So, however, does UH, right, the finite element solution, uh, belong to uh, H1 on omega, okay, right? Remember, so what we're asking is, what this means is, if you recall, is the following. If we integrate over omega, u h square plus uh, 1 over measure of omega to the power 1 over number of spatial dimensions, okay? Um, sorry, this should be 2 over number of spatial dimensions, okay? times u h comma x square dx, right? If we do this, okay, what we're asking is, is this quantity bounded? Think about it. UH is not continuous, okay? So, what we will find is that this term, right, the derivative term is discontinuous. However, if we integrate it, right, discontinuities are not unintegrable, right? They can be integrated, okay? So, when we integrate it, we will see that this quantity that we put down here uh, on the left-hand side is indeed bounded. Okay, so the answer is yes. Okay, right, so e even though these discontinuities themselves don't pose a problem. Okay, all right, now, okay, so, so UH does belong in H1. Okay, so I'm going to use this uh, background to uh, say that, um, and, and of course, you know, we, of course, UH belongs in H1 because that's how we constructed UH, right? Remember when we defined SH, right? So recall UH belongs to SH, which consists of, we, we said that it consists of all functions UH belonging to H1, right, on omega. And then we put in boundary conditions and so on, right? So, so by construction, it does belong to H1, and I'm, I'm just pointing out that, yes, it does indeed belong to H1. Okay, with this as background, I'm going to start defining some norms. OK, 